Uh, we've been working through Second Samuel, and uh, we have permission to meet indoors, uh, which is great from the Supreme Court. But we are still uh, going to be doing videos for those who aren't able to go because they're high risk or uh, want to stay home for whatever reason uh, because of COVID. And so uh, we want to do that. And we do want to encourage you, if possible, get out to your care group, uh, go be with the with God's people. Uh, but if you're not able to, uh, we understand that, and so we want to provide these videos for you. We are on chapter 13, and so we're going to continue walking through the book. We do want to encourage you get on the website, uh, find the commentary, get the questions, go through them. I think it'll be very instructive and helpful. These videos are intended to be just an introduction. There's so much more in each of these chapters to cover, uh, but we can't cover it all here and, and really it would be long. So this is just a simple introduction to sort of uh, whet your appetite and get you going after those uh, the commentary and the questions. Well, we come to chapter 13 and uh, we've had lots that's happened already. <laughs> David has become king in Hebron and then in Israel. He brings the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem and then God makes him a covenant in in chapter 7. And you and David really seems like the, the answer to Israel's problems, really the answer to the world's problems. He's a righteous man. Uh, and then in chapter 8 and 9, we see David carrying out that righteousness. He's not loving gold. He's not loving power. He's he, he's keeping his covenant. Uh, he's covenantly, he, he's faithful to his covenant with Jonathan. And we just see him doing all these righteous things. You think, man, this is a great guy. Chapter 10, we see the cracks in the foundation, so to speak. He stays home when the army goes out to war and you feel his spiritual heart tipping. And then in chapter 11, we find him sinning in such a grievous way. He steals Bathsheba. Uh, he, he has adul an adulterous affair with her, and then he murders her husband uh, to hide it. And, and we saw at the end of chapter 11 that it was secret, and yet God reveals it. And in chapter 12, God sends Nathan the prophet to confront David. Now, David repents of his sin in that moment, but God says, listen, the sword will not depart from your house. The things that were done in secret will now be done in public. And the narrator ends chapter 12, and in a sense, you sort of feel like, well, it seems like nothing's really happened. Chapter 13 now is the beginning of those events unfolding, and the narrator tells us that. He shows us that by how he writes it. If you look at chapter 13, verse 1, what you see here is that this is the story of Amnon and Tamar. Now, Amnon is David's oldest son, and Tamar is the full sister of one of his other sons, Absalom. Now, this uh, son, Absalom, he was born from Makkah. We know this from chapter 3, verse 3, uh, who was a Gentile wife, uh, not, a, not a Jewish woman. She, he was a, she was a Gentile from the kingdom of Geshur in the north. And, and so, so Absalom is born to this woman, and in their uh, in their relationship, in, in, in Absalom's uh, care for Tamar, you find out that now this is really what's going to be the way that God fulfills his promises to David uh, to, to have the sword not depart from his house in chapter 12. So the way this unfolds is, and, and you even see it, look at verse 1, it says, Now after the, it was after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Now, Ultimately, Amnon and Tamar are the main characters in this in this story. But what's actually happening here is the narrator is showing us the roots of Absalom's rebellion. And this is going to last all the way through to chapter 20. This war, really, between David and Absalom is all going to be now unpacked for a host of chapters. And the roots of when this all starts to take place are in chapter 13. And so we have this story from, cha from chapter 13, verse 1, all the way down to uh, 1, verse 19, where Amnon uh, violates his sister Tamar. Now, there's lots of things here that we can talk about. Very simply, this is a violation of uh, the Mosaic Law. They were too close of relationship even to be married. It's also a violation, obviously, of the Mosaic Law because he rapes her. It's unrighteous, sinful. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of stuff going on here. And Amnon loves her because she's beautiful. It's really not an issue of love. It's an issue of lust. He wants to have his sister. He, he's, he's acting sick. And then uh, a friend, the son of Shimei, who's one of David's brothers, his name is Jonadab, he comes and says he's a shrewd man and he comes and he tells Amnon if you want to you know if you want to like get her alone essentially there's a way you can do it just pretend that you're sick and ask her to come and make cakes for you well that's exactly what Amnon does he takes this advice he calls her into his house, then he calls her into his bedchamber, and she is unsuspecting. This is her brother. She doesn't think anything of it. She comes in uh, totally unsuspecting. He grabs her, and he violates her. Now, this story takes lots of verses, but that's what takes place. And right before he does it, she says this to him. Uh, he says, Come, lie with me, my sister. Now, that my sister there is not just a blood relationship, but also a, a, a warmth of feeling. He's expressing some care for her. She says, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting here is that when she says, 
such a thing is not done in Israel. Remember, this is exactly what David has done. He's been an adulterer. He's violated the normal marriage relationships. And, and, then, uh, and then in verse 13, she says, As for me, where could I get rid of my reproach? And as for you, you will be like one of the fools in Israel. The word Nabal, Nabal there. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for, who, for he will not withhold me from you. Now, we don't know if the king would have said no or not. Tamar's point here is saying, look, Look, it's much better to do this in the right way. If you really love me, we could be together. That, that's a possibility. But at this point, the, what you're doing right now is going to make you a fool. It's going to make me a shameful reproach. And this should not be done. It's so unrighteous. Now, all of that is fascinating because what's actually say, what, what was actually happening there is Amnon is just acting like his dad. He's acting exactly like David did, living according to lust and sinning because of it. And in verse 14, we see this. He would not listen to her since he was stronger than she. He violated her and lay with her. So you have Amnon carrying out effectively what David did. Now, what's different about Amnon and David, though, is that we see in verses 15 through 19 that Amnon is worse. He, having done this, now hates her. And this hatred that he has for her is greater than the love that he had for her, and he throws her out. Now, this is really important because the law said that if a man were to do such a thing, to, to rape an innocent virgin, he had two choices, and they were, the choice was really up to the father of the girl. Either he had to marry her and he could never divorce her again for the rest of his life, or number two, he had to pay as though she had already gotten married. He had to pay the bride price uh, because of what he had done to her. And so, and, and so that's what he had to do according to the law of Moses, but he does neither of these things, and this happens all the way down through verse 19. And she obviously comes to, when she when he throws her out and tells the servants to lock the door, verse 16, she says to him, no, this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you have done to me. In other words, not only did you violate the law of Moses there, but now you're doubly doing it. It's actually worse than what you did before. You're just compounding your sin. He totally ignores her and throws her out. She obviously is devastated. And so she walks out and she tears the shirt that she had been given because she was a virgin daughter of the king showing that she had lost her virginity in an unrighteous way. She puts ashes on her head. Uh, she's in mourning at this point, and she's mourning because of the loss of her, essentially her virginity, but also her purity and everything else that was associated with that. She's a victim of Amnon's lust. It's very unrighteous. And, and it says that she cries aloud as she went. She, she was mourning over the sin that's been committed to her, understandably, completely understandably. Well, Absalom finds her and, she, and, and asks her a question. He says, has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Well, there's no answer here. He, she just, he just says, now, but now keep silent, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this matter to heart. Now, he seems to sort of make, make light of what's happened. And, and when you first read that, you think, okay, well, he's telling her not to take it to heart. Uh, what's going on here? What's fascinating is that he's the one who takes it to heart, and we're going to find that out later. But what does David do? Verse 21, it says, When King David heard of all these matters, he was very angry. But then nothing else happens. Now, that's a huge problem. David should have either forced Amnon to marry Tamar, demanded that Amnon pay, or third, could have killed him for having violated the law of Moses and refusing to submit himself to what Moses had commanded. Uh, any of those three options. And, and David doesn't do any of those. He doesn't take any, uh, he doesn't exercise any authority over Amnon. And we find out that's because he loved Amnon. He was, Amnon was his favorite son. Well, that's a huge problem. It shows that David is not willing to, fe to keep the law of Moses. Why is that important? Well, because before his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, David was keeping the law of Moses. And now we see that the sin that happened with Bathsheba and Uriah has had ramifications on David's life. He's no longer a righteous king. He's not walking in the way that he should in specific. And he has a soft spot in his heart for his sons. He's letting them sin. Now, remember, 1 Samuel started with a man who had a soft spot in his heart for his sons. Eli with Hophni and Phinehas. He, he let them do whatever they wanted, and that resulted in massive chaos in the nation of Israel. And that's exactly exactly what's going to happen with David here. And so Absalom in his heart knows this, and so he waits two years to let sort of everything blow over. Very, very cunning. He waits two years to let everything blow over, and then starting in verse 24, Absalom now comes and asks if he can have everyone come out to his sheep fest, his sheep shearing festival. This is a normal time of feasting. It would have been a normal thing. He invites the king and presses the king to come in verse 24 and 25, and then he says, well, if you won't go, and he's trusting that David says no. If David says, yes, no problem. Everyone goes. They have a feast. But if David says no, that leaves him an opportunity to invite Amnon. And so he invites Amnon. And David says, why do you want him to go with you? And Absalom pushes him. And he says, well, you've blessed my feast. And therefore, someone who represents the king should come. That should be Amnon, the crown prince. David agrees, sends Amnon along with all the other king's sons out. 
Now, Absalom commanded his servants, and he said, when you see Amnon, you kill him after he's had too much to drink. And so he's betting on Amnon's uh, uh, his lack of self-control. Amnon does exactly that, and then Absalom's servants kill him. And so Absalom gets his vengeance on Amnon. And then you have the story as you follow through here that essentially the king thinks all of his sons are dead. He's told by Jonadab, who again shows up at the, the exact wrong time. He's told by Jonadab that it's not that. It's just Amnon who is dead, and that's because of what's happened with Absalom. And all of this brings us to this conclusion. Well, what's happened? Well, essentially, the beginnings of chaos in the kingdom have begun. What, what's happened? Well, you have one prince killing another prince because that prince has a lustful problem with the sister, the princess, and all of these things connected. If you put them all together, you have lust, murder, and, and hatred between people. What is all that? That's exactly what was going on in David's life. Lust and murder, lying, hatred, all of this is happening. All of it's happening essentially in, 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 with, as a replica of what took place in David's life, but instead it's between his sons. It's in his own house now. Now you have all this showing you that God is fulfilling his promises in chapter 12. But in verse 34, we see that Absalom fled. Absalom flees away from the city. He runs away. The king now is brokenhearted over Amnon. If you look in verse 37, Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. Where does he go? He goes back to his Gentile roots, where his mom was from. David mourned for his son every day. He weeps over Amnon. So Absalom's gone. He's with the Gentiles. David's weeping for Amnon. And now he's gone for three years, we find out in verse 38. But what happens in David's heart? Fascinating. Verse 39, the, the heart of King David longed to go out to Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon because he was dead. What does David want to do? He wants Absalom back. He doesn't want to punish him. He's carried out his own vengeance. He doesn't have the right to do that. He, he's actually violated the law of Moses. He should be killed. But what does David want to do? He wants to bring him back again. And what you see here is David has a tender and merciful heart, but the problem is that he's unwilling to do what's right. His mercy is clouding his judgment. It's, and what that tells you is it's not real mercy. It's not genuine mercy that comes out of his heart. Instead, it's, it's an unmerciful heart that's actually just loving himself. He's ultimately very selfish. His heart is comforted concerning Amnon, and therefore he wants Absalom around. He doesn't want righteousness in the kingdom. He wants his own desires to be met. And that's really what's going on in David's heart. So what we're seeing here is actually the unfolding of David's unrighteousness, and it's going to continue. Now, Joab is going to capitalize on this. He's going to get Absalom back again, and then Absalom is going to start his conspiracy in chapter 15. And this is going to continue all the way through until Absalom is killed and David is restored to the throne all the way back into chapter 19 and chapter 20. And all and all of those events are going to take place all the way until we get to chapter 20. Uh, it's, it's all going to show that God's promise to David about what's happening in this family is coming to pass. Well, I hope that's helpful for you to understand chapter 13 and where it fits into the flow of the narrative. Again, take some time, read the commentary. We hope this is helpful for you. Thanks.